be thinking about doing it. Okay. Now, the first thing I have in this little package uh, of portrait things here, and this is going to be an introduction to our portrait, uh, as I mentioned, uh, information. And in this little package that I have, what I'd like to do is uh, cover some of the material that we will be utilizing in the course. Okay, first of all, you may wonder why this sheet is on in the package initially. Well, like in so many of the things that I've done with the uh, portraits and other things, a lot of, a lot of the lessons will be uh, spontaneous in the sense that someone may have a particular problem or a question and, uh, and, and I'll just answer it on the spot and it turns out somebody says reproduce a copy of this for me. And, uh, and then I realize it's, it's important enough that uh, it's worth reproducing for everyone. I need to do an updated drawing and not have a, the side of a face crashed in, Trudy. But other than that, she's in pretty good shape for the shape she's in. But what we have here is a sample sheet I just put in at the beginning for you to keep. Because as you go further along, uh, you're going to find that... Uh, would you get that portrait for me over there that I'm doing? As you go further along, you're going to find that one of the key ways that you draw people is not going to be by drawing uh, actual facts, even though you have to have things anatomically correct. You're, you're going to find that your basic information that's going to that's going to make something look like or someone look like the person is going to be understanding your light source and understanding your shapes. And that's what creates a light. Now, if any of you remember when our pen and ink artist was here, what was it, Simmons? Uh, what was Gary. it? Gary Simmons. He made a very profound statement. He did some beautiful pen and ink drawings uh, of people. And uh, I'll never forget that Gary uh, showed us and, and how he did certain things and brought out a point that I never forgot, and that is that you capture likenesses by creating shapes. Okay, and then within shapes, you create other shapes. And you'll see what I mean more by this in a moment. But one of the critical uh, things related to this is the highlights. And one of the greatest difficulties you're going to have doing portraits is you're going to try to do portraits from photographs where the highlights are not clear. So one day a student asked me, you're welcome to stay and visit if you'd like, if you want to sit now. Okay, great. So what we'll do is... Uh, We'll imagine this with a light source, and, you, and, and your problem is you won't see this clearly in your reference material. So you have to understand that as your light comes from this direction, I'm going to have a highlight here, a highlight here, a highlight here, one here, one here, 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 and here. And generally on the lips and on the nose and on that part of the nose, just like the dots indicate. Now this has to be there whether you see it or not. And that's the key to understanding the form in, in doing portraits. Now, let's see how large this will be on the screen. Here's an example of a portrait that I'm doing of a lady uh, from Alexandria, Louisiana. And I want you to notice I've got about two and a half hours in this, including the drawing. Look at the highlight, 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 etc. That's the first thing that you need to recognize in doing portraits. So this first sheet is important and it's good because it gives you a general outline. Now, the lesson that we're going to accomplish today is going to be a lesson where we are going to understand the head as a round shape. More specifically, we're going to understand the head as an oval shape or an egg shape which I'll describe a little bit more to you in a moment. But we're going to break it down by front view. Then we're going to show you what happens when you rotate the head, what happens when you tilt it, and then what happens when you have what I call a complex rotation and tilt. This will be our lesson for today, and it concerns primarily uh, explaining the placement of the features. Okay, next week, we'll spend a lesson actually drawing the features. And I'm going to have you draw these things relatively large. We're going to draw eyes, we're going to draw lips, we're going to draw a nose, 
and we're going to draw an ear. Now, the problem when people, the, that most people have when they go in the portraits is I have all that you'll ever really need to know forever about doing people right here on these little sheets. And 95% of my students do not go back and recall lesson one. They don't go back to the basics. And they keep forgetting the same basic things over and over and over until they get enough experience with it. Okay, now, the next lesson we're going to do is we're going to draw this, we're going to draw this gentleman who's so ugly, he's really cute. And where he was uh, very effective is it gave me an, an, an opportunity to actually show you how to sketch him draw someone and actually do something that looked like a person developing all the different facts that I'm teaching you without having to go into a lot of detail. And I think it's a great confidence builder and it's one that you can hang on your living room wall when you get finished and be delighted with it. Then we're going to do someone that's very attractive from a front view and we'll show you how you have to say a lot with a little. Uh, this one is a complex rotation and tilt and it's another one that's designed specifically to draw and shade. And as you can notice on the layout, I'll break this down in a way that you can follow it. We spend one lesson drawing babies because the anatomy on children is quite different than the anatomy on adult. And the divisions are different. The second to last lesson that we have, and this generally takes an 11-week period, is where we're going to actually draw uh, this little boy from a front view, excuse me, we're not going to draw him. The last two lessons we concentrate on technique of how to shade, as far as how to shade. And, uh, and this is where I'm going to teach you a method I've kind of developed, and, and we may even improve it with those new pencils that you got, where I would show people how to layer the graphite. The biggest problem you have in drawing portraits is you'll tend to overwork the medium and age the person. So I'll perfect the media, perfect it away by laying in the light, middle tone, dark, and graded stages that you can make it almost as smooth as a photograph. With these Derwent pencils, we're even going to do it simpler than that because of the quality of the lead. But this is something we're just going to transfer to illustration board, and I'm going to teach you that technique. And then last of all, everybody's favorite, Bob Hope. And okay, let's see if I have another... Uh, Yes, here's my original on that. And what this is something again, you're going to transfer to uh, pastel paper, and uh, we'll flip this over like this, and I'll have a color picture of that one for you to use. And then we're actually going to do a gray and white uh, sketch of Bob Hope. And if you'll notice on the monitor as well as on the scene, 90% of what I've done here is is the pure paper. And this is the technique showing how by using a medium charcoal pencil and a little white charcoal uh, pastel pencil, how you can create a very interesting effect without using a lot of medium. And again, trying to teach you that you can draw people without a lot of uh, overworking, as most people do, just by simply knowing the facts and laying things in correctly. This pretty well concludes the first 11-week uh, period or however long it takes you. Now, the follow-up to that is to go into pastel portraits in color where we don't do any more drawing, we just concentrate on the actual scenes and, uh, and then we progressively go on to eventually oils or watercolor portraits or whatever it is that you would like to do. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to lesson one. And lesson one is going to concern the actual layout of the person, the divisions of the head, and where to put the, uh, the actual features. Now, before we do any of this, let's think of the head as, I think it might be better to show this initially without. Let's look at this plastic egg, by the way, not a real one, uh, as uh, the basic shape of the head. The biggest thing I think people have, the biggest fear people have maybe in doing portraits is the intimidation of doing a person. What I'd like to do is show you that the person is nothing but a shape and it's got form that's created by lights, middle tones, and darks. And let's see if we can create what I'm speaking of. If we take this egg and we put, let's see if I can get the right setting. Okay, we take this egg 
and I put a light source on the left side, right side of it, shining to your left, what do we have? We all of a sudden have a rounded shape that has a light source, it has shadow on the side, it has reflected light and a cast shadow behind it, just like a circle. Now the difference is, when we take this shape and we divide it and we add a, 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 cone, a, a four sided shape for a nose and we block in eyes and we start putting in shadows, you're going to see really quickly how quickly this becomes a person. And the primary lesson is to teach you the facts but to never let you forget that you're dealing with a three dimensional object and once you put your facts in correctly, this is actually created by the way you handle shapes and values. So as an example, let's put our egg in here. See that's showing up all right on the screen, good. Now here's our egg shape. Now what we're going to learn today is that you have a center line on the face and you have certain divisions that will give you an idea of where to place the features. Now, if we wanted this to look like a, a human being, the first thing I would do would put a four-sided shape that's just an angular shape here, but somewhat the shape of a triangle. If my light source is coming from over here, I'm going to shade this in, I'm going to shade this in, and I'm going to cast a shadow under it like this. Okay, immediately, now this may not be laid in there exactly right, and leaves a little bit to be desired, but you get the general idea. Okay, I'll put some eyebrows up here and here. Suggest something for eyes. Now what do I have with the lips? The lips are angular shapes in that they're cut, they come out. So we'll shade in this top lip. Just put a little line up underneath here with a shadow for this bottom part. We'll come back and put an ear. And just as we saw in our shaded area, we'll kind of figure out where the form is going to be. And all of a sudden, we have the makings of a person, you see? And of course, you could take it and begin to develop it more, and that's not what I'm primarily interested in doing at this time. But you get the idea of how it's just an egg shape that you add form to, you glue shapes to it, and it begins to give you the feeling of a person. And that's all it is. Now, for lesson one, I'm going to show you some steps. It's going to be this lesson here. And basically, I'm going to show you how to put in a center line, how to start with a circle, and for every view that we do, okay, we're going to start exactly the same way. And you're going to find that everything that you'll ever do to do a person starts the same, and there's only four possible options that you can have in drawing that person. So let's start like this. And the first thing I always begin with is a circle. Actually, I'll put a center line. And then a circle. Okay, because what do I want to think of this as? A symmetrical object. Okay, now, within that circle, this is going to be a front view. I'm going to draw the egg. Now, the first thing I want to be aware of is that the face is broken up into three different divisions. The first division is not the top of the skull, but it's right below that where your skull begins to curve back, okay? The next of it, third division is the eyebrow, the next is the bottom of the nose. Now I'm drawing this a little bit more loosely so it'll come up on the television. Okay, now, with this in mind, we know that the eyebrows are going to be here on this third, bottom of the nose here, and the lips will be in here. So the first thing I'm going to do, and let's see if I can maybe, uh, I'm using a, a kind of a soft pencil so it'll show up on the screen. Let's see if I can do that a little bit lighter and still, I may have to go a little bit darker than that. Convey what I'm trying to convey. It doesn't have to be perfect. This just gives us perimeters here. Okay. And then we have a third, third, 
third. Now, I should have drawn the oval first, but you get the general idea. And you really could do it either way, or the egg shape first. Okay, now that's going to be a little easier for us to do. Okay, now I'm going to start, first of all, sketching in the nose. Now, we're not going into any facial anatomy today as far as studying the details and facts about the face. I want to show you only how simple it is to position the facts correctly and how it, and then we see our nose. Okay, and then we'll come up, we know the eyebrows sit on here, here, and then we'll draw this approximately where we think it should be. Now, I think I came out a little further with this because normally your eyes will be somewhere in this area, you see, but that'll vary with different people. See you next week. So we'll do this. And then we'll come over and we'll do this. And again, I'm not worried about it being anatomically perfect. Come in with our lips down here. Now remember, it's just a wedge. It comes out, so we'll put the top lip in. Bottom lip, you're only going to generally see this. Now the ears are going to fit in between these two lines. And really the majority of your features are right in this area right here between the eyebrows and the nose. We'll come down like this, square the jaw off, I've got him looking a little bit longer than I, I made it a little narrower across here, but you get the idea. And that's how you really develop your likeness, to be truthful with you, uh, when you're doing this. Okay, now I made him look like a Kilroy so I could show the shape of the head. Okay, that's how we do our front view. You got that down pretty well. Okay, now we're going to turn the page and let's look at our side view, or our rotation rather. Now the rotation is a center line with a circle, with an egg, but then we take the center of the face and we move it over here to just basically rot to rotate the face. So what have I done? I, th I think I need another round object maybe to show this. Let's look at this can. Okay, I'm looking at the front of this can. This is the center of it. Now what happens when I start doing this? I'm rotating it. I'm not tilting it now. I'm just keeping it on the same plane. If it had a center line going through it, it's the same center line and I'm rotating it. Okay, now watch how I'm going to begin drawing it exactly the same way again. Center line, circle, center line helps me divide my circle symmetrically. Egg shape, see, and this is the key to the success of this program. I leave out anything that's not necessary. I think it's the key to it. Here's the center line for my rotation. Now watch, I come back, the divisions are all the same. A third, a third, and a third. And this will be where your biggest problem is going to be, is it going to be in your divisions. Okay, now I'm going to come down, the nose again. And this is a rotation, and it's a little easy if you're doing it from an actual person sometime. But we'll just do that part like this. Okay, it's always easy to come in and put those, those eyebrows. I like to do that because it, it starts bringing it out immediately. Now, the only thing I do a little bit differently is as I come down with this line on a rotation, I straighten it out. Okay, because you're not going to get that curve at this angle. Now, I'm going to show foreshortening on the eyes as well as the lips and everything else on it. Now, notice how, again, our ear is going to come in between this area. And of course, the space you leave in here and how you sh divide it is what really gets the likeness. Lastly, I'll come across here. And that's an eye. An eye. Okay, now, you'll have to study this anatomically to get a little more comfortable with it. But there's your cheekbone. You'll generally come around. Your muscle will go around. Lips will come across like this pick that jawbone up. Okay, now likewise, we'll bring it up. Now the only difference here is because we're seeing it rotated, we're going to see a little bit of the back of that skull. 
And then we'll bring the hair around again. we we'll show old Kilroy like that where we can bring out a little bit more. And that's our second shape. But notice again, the same format as we started with it. Okay. The third uh, thing we want to think about now. Okay, we had the front. We had the rotation. And then lastly, we have the tip. Now, if I'm looking at this can like this, okay, I rotated it a minute ago like this. And I'm going to come back like this. If I tilt it, I do this. Okay? So that's what we want to imagine. Now watch how e easy it is to accomplish this if you just use this little simple formula that, that we're using. Okay. Start here. Bring it down to here. Secondly, we'll do this. And see, the key to it is to learn these first few steps. Here's our egg again. Okay, here's our divisions. Okay, now, but what's the, di the main difference is because this is tilted now, we're going to draw this following the tilt of the head. All the thirds are going to remain the same. They're just going to be far shortened. So what I have first of all, let's put the nose in. It's going to be down quite a bit. The eyebrows are going to be almost on a line following this. You're going to, not going to see much of the eyes. That's our nose. Lips are going to be almost like a line, you see. And of course, you could define this better anatomically if you were looking at a person rather than looking at, uh, at what we're looking at here, you know, an actual photograph of a person. But now watch how the ears, again, they're going to fall right in the same area, same area over here. Now the skull, you all make allowances for that. And bring it around and then lastly, you always bring that jawbone down, square it off the way it needs to be. And there we have our tilt. Piece of cake, huh? Love it, all right. Now last of all, and maybe the one that's the most complex is called rotation and tilt. And that's where we're going to actually take what we've got here. And notice, beginning with our, our basic shapes, okay, we're actually, go we're actually going to do this. If this was the front view, we're going to rotate it like this, and then we're going to tilt it forward, if you can picture that in your mind. Now, that sounds terribly complicated. That's why I call it complex rotation and tilt. But if we start with a center line, then an eight, then a round shape that's symmetrical or supposedly is symmetrical. Close enough. Then an egg shape. Okay. Now, what do we do? Let's put our divisions in. Third, third, third. But now, what are we doing? We're going to rotate. That's our first line. Then we're going to tilt. So we start here. Now again, this should really should come down a little straighter, but what you have to remember, Trudy, they're guidelines, okay? They're not anything that you, you, you really have to do it by looking at the person, looking at the objects. Okay, here comes our eyebrows. You see how they follow that line? Here's our eyes again. Okay, now we don't want to have this coming out. We'll sort of straighten this line out a little bit. But we are going to pick up this like this. Now, following it again back here, we'll pick up our ear. We're going to have a little bit of roundness on the back of that skull. You see? And then bring this in. Bring old Kilroy's hairline down like this. Now again, so you'll learn there's a break here, another break here, and then it's just the muscle content. You'll learn all of this as you do enough of it. Now is that a piece of cake or is that a piece of cake? Okay, now the first thing I want you to do, I'm going to give you the four sheets that I drew. You have this in your package. 
Okay, and if you have time at home or when you come back next week or whatever, I'll uh, I'd like for you to uh, I'd like for you to come in and and I'd like to just practice on these. Don't do them smaller than I've done them. If anything, do it bigger. Okay, and that pretty well concludes our first lesson, which emphasizes placement of features. Lesson two will concern the actual features themselves. Now we reviewed the lesson last week uh, in, in the portraits explaining the sequence of the lessons going from, first of all, learning how to place the anatomy correctly on the face, which I think is very important. Now, today, our lesson is going to consist of actually concentrating on certain facts about the features. Now, one of the, uh, one of the things that I feel very strongly about that people fail to do in portraiture is to almost without fail as people begin to do portraits on their own, they fail to remember the few basic things I'm going to teach you on each feature. And because they fail to remember uh, these things, what happens is uh, they keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again. So I can't stress to you enough as you're looking at this, even for those of you that have done this before, we're going to start today by learning how to draw the eye correctly, the lips correctly, the nose, and then the ear. And each of these uh, features will have only a few basic uh, things that you need to remember. And that's the problem with portraiture in general with people is that they forget just these few small things. So I'm going to really stress them, especially in light of the fact that I'm recording this. Now let's see if I can... Uh, put our remote control on again. Bring that in a little bit closer. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's just begin with the eye. That'll be a good starting point. I'll just maybe turn my sheet sideways like this. Now, the first thing we want to remember about the eye as we look at it is the fact that what you've got here is a round ball. And it's a round ball that actually sits in a socket. And so whenever you see the, the shading of the eyelid, which is very important, and the shading around the side, and the shading under the lid, it's simply because what you have is a ball that's placed within the muscles of the skull. And the eyelid is just a thin covering that opens and closes. And so if you think of it as a round shape and everything in it uh, being shaded as a round shape with a light source, then it pretty well explains to you what to do and how to do it. For instance, let's just say for our purposes initially, what we've got is a round ball. Now, if any of you ever took biology, I don't know whether they still do it or not, but we had a, a slaughterhouse close by, so we got all the cow eyes we wanted. Oh, my goodness. I remember uh, in some of the better schools in New Orleans, some of you may remember this, if you really studied and worked hard and got advanced enough, you got to skin a cat. But it was all in the cause of science. So. But we actually took an eyeball and, what do you call it, dissected? I don't even dissected. remember. Yeah, I found it. You know, it's very interesting. Larry, that, uh, but that cat skin deal, that wasn't science. That was at recess, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you took the cat man to say that. No. <laughs> the famous cat killer. All right. Now, since it's a round ball. Not exactly. Yes, exactly. Ask, call the, S call the SPCA and ask him about the cat man over on <laughs> Phillips Street. All right, now what I'm wanting you to think of is that this is a round shape. It has shadows as if it had a light source coming from over here. And what you're basically doing 
is you're just covering this round shape with a lid. You see? And again, years ago when you studied anatomy in an art school, you studied anatomy and you learned all the muscles, the mu muscles, the bones, everything which is good. But I think they spent too much time doing it as a doctor when I don't think it was necessary. Now, because I have the skin pulled over this shape, okay, we have the ball, lost myself there for just a second with that phone call. And then we have the iris and then we have the pupil. Okay, now, what we want to remember is because this lid comes over here, we're going to have a shadow under it. And in a moment, I'm going to show you a picture of one of Sergeant's eyes, which he was so good at, and I've learned a lot from. But anyhow, basically, just to give you an idea of what this shading is. So this is, these are some of the basic things that you need to remember uh, related to this. So it, it is a round ball. It sits in a socket. And then you have a lid that opens and closes over it. And just think a little bit about some of this basic anatomy and study it, study the light, study the shadows, and you'll find that this, this is something that's really very simple to learn. Now, with that in mind, I'm not going to sketch it from the ground up <coughs> or from the eyeball up, but I'm going to just come in and just draw the actual eye itself. Now normally, depending on the view of the person, you'll have a peak like this and it'll cross over. And I might mention when you're doing eyes, if you draw it and the eye peaks like this because of the position of the, the lid, it's going to peak the same way over here. Okay, it'll always have the same basic symmetry. Okay, now I might have this over a little too far, but that's all right. Now, we'll come around like this. Now, normally, a lot of what you do on the bottom lid, you just really leave the white space and try to do it as much as you can with shading. Okay, now, there's several things that I'm going to teach you on this <clears throat> and uh, that you need to remember. Number one, I have a little note on the sheet, the top lid should touch the pupil. Now, what happens in many cases, people are copying photographs, and when a person has the photograph taken, they have spotlights on them. And it dilates the eyes, and the pupils are very tiny. It looks very unnatural. So it'll give the person a stare. So you want to not draw what you see most of the time. You want to draw what you know. Now, we'll just come around and start shading the part, outer part of the eye here. Now, that's another whole study in itself because I've had people tell me that, that maybe did eye makeup and whatever you call the things that they do in those stores that you'll have some people that their eyes, the pigmentation in the eye will actually just fade almost and there's no definition on the outer edge. And then you'll have some where you'll have a little definition like this and then you'll have some where you might have a little bit of a linear pattern out here. And then even maybe some where you'll have a little bit here. You see? So uh, everyone will be different. But one thing we want to remember is that th this must touch the top lid. The pupil must. Now, most of the time it isn't. So what you do is you put a shadow under here. And you lose it, you see. Now, one of the most crucial things, I have a man over in uh, Madisonville right now that's doing portraits. He's very good about details, and he's very good about remembering facts. I always like to start with the eyes, because I find if you can get the eyes in there correctly, uh, and you, you'll get your lights, your middle tones, your darks in there, and I find it really sets the tone for the rest of the painting and makes it a lot easier. Personally, I've found, I've discovered that. You know, it's, everybody does it differently. But he, that's what he does. He gets the eyes and whatever in there perfectly. You get, you get all your color, all your shadows, whatever. But he remembers you always have to have a shadow under that eye. 
you see, and it's going to generally be round, like this, and maybe some of the pigmentation over here, and you're going to have a shadow on the opposite side, and it's going to generally be, so we're drawing this more with form, actually, than we are once we understand a few basic things about it. And because it's a round ball, that shadow will generally curve around here like this. And let's see if I can even maybe bring this in just a little bit closer. And these are just, as I mentioned, these are just a few facts that uh, are not that complicated, but very few people go back to lesson one and remember them. Okay, now I actually just went up a little bit high with that. Let's just erase that quickly. because I want, I want this to actually be the definition for this lid. So our round part is going to kind of come like this. Now, I'll generally turn it around and just make the shadow extremely dark, right up under the lid, and then blend it down. And I like to, to blend all of this. Okay, now I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But... Uh, the next thing I'd like to do is to put our little top section where the muscle is pushed back here, like this. <laughs> and then you're going to have a little shadow right above here. We'll put that in. Okay, now, as I mentioned, you can have a little shadow above here. And then notice on the underside of it, though, we'll come around like this. And we're going to continue and de actually develop that lower lid with shadow. And it softens it, and that way you don't have to put a lot of line work in it. And then sometimes if I'm sketching, I'll use a, a vertical pattern like that because it, it does tend to make it look structured a little bit more like it should be. Okay, and then of course on the bottom portion of it here, We'll just kind of bring this along and indicate it by suggestion. Okay, and as you f feel your way into it, you can shade a little bit more as you might want to or feel like you need to. Okay, now, you generally have a little section over here that will be defined more by uh, shadow than anything else. And you might have some little areas in here. Now, whenever you're doing something like this, be kind. Anytime you're doing those wrinkles, consider that if somebody was doing you, you wouldn't want them too severe. All right. Now, coming to do our uh, eyebrow itself now, I want to just kind of block it in. Of course, this is following the skull. So what we found, the primary thing that we want to remember on this is that we want to make sure that the, the, the pupil... Uh, touches the top lid. We want to make sure that uh, we show the shadow under the eye. Now, normally, whenever you're going to do the eyebrows, you want to make the edges a little bit uneven where they don't look like they're actually cut out and pasted on. Now, I know some people actually, when they do their eyebrows, what do you call that when you make them straight? Pluck. Tweeze, right, whatever you, you do it. You know, well, that's for a particular effect. But what you normally want to do is you want to have a, a lost area and then inside the middle of this section, you come in and you shade it rather darkly and that attaches it normally. And then towards the edges, it may just be broken up and with some people, you don't even see any distinction at all. Some people just don't even have any uh, to speak of. Okay, now, I'll put in a little shading here, because you'll normally have your cast shadow like this around the, the uh, side, on the side of the nose. That's going to be very important for defining this. Okay, and then normally where the skull comes around like this, you also want to have a little shading. to complete the roundness of it like this. And of course, that will all depend on the light source. And then lastly, what I do is I wait and make sure I have everything in there pretty much like I think I want it. And then I like to come in 
and put in the eyelashes. Really, I never thought about it. Well, just get your portrait done. And we don't charge a whole lot extra. Danielle called me last week, said that he, he's out, they got him in this who's who of uh, comic book illustrators now. Really? And he asked me, he says, uh, do you mind? He says, they put in there that I had a diploma from the Baton Rouge Fine Arts Academy. <laughs> and uh, I said, well, that's, no, I said, that's okay. But he, he says, I didn't tell him to do it. I said, you know nobody graduates from this school, but, uh, but that's all right. But I said, if you want a diploma, I've got a $25 diploma, a $50 <laughs> diploma. Whatever what you, way you want it to be made. Okay, now, that gives you a pretty good idea of what we're talking about up the eye. Now, let's repeat the things again. We want the, the shadow under the lid, we want the pupil to be touching the top lid. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we show the roundness of the eyeball. And, you know, people think the eye is white. Normally, it's gray or blue. It's very seldom ever solid white. But the primary thing you're thinking about is the shadow, would be the shadows under here. Okay, and then when we put our eye brow on up here, we want to make sure that we leave it uneven, except as we uh, do the inner part of it or get a lost and found effect, actually. A little repetition with variation is what we're really trying to get. Okay, now before I leave this, let me pull this book and show you all what I'm talking about on this. Now, this is a close-up of uh, one of Sargent's paintings. And by the way, Sargent has his, some of his, they have some of his work on display at the museum in New Orleans. But if you'll look closely at the book since we're here on the screen, you notice it's almost a milky look in these eyes. And it's kind of like an iridescence, like the light is coming through. Mm -hmm. Notice all of the things that I'm telling you about, the shadows under the lids, and he just had a very soft, uh, really, really elegant, elegant feminine quality about the way he did this. And, uh, but notice we're only gonna have one white dot here and one white dot here, and I'm gonna show you where to place that. But notice that there's almost no definition where the shadow comes down into the pupil in the iris, you see? And, and that I've learned in my own, it makes it look so much more natural than trying to put this in there like that. And, uh, but you notice the shadow here, and we have all the basic definitions, but what amazes me is so much of it is kind of lost and found. Now, with that in mind, I'd like to just come back and darken this a little bit more and actually try to create the same effect. I want to make sure we get this nice and solid. But then this part here, you see, will just fade it and it just softens everything in general. Not necessarily that much, but uh, I'm always intrigued with this last step where I come in and put the uh, white spot. So you're not supposed to do that. Okay. Now notice I always put it right at the point between the iris and the pupil. Look at how that just makes it come alive mm -hmm. on, the, on the screen. Okay. Now, that's basically what I wanted to cover with you on the eye. And, uh, of course, I'd like you to do it as big as I did this one over here when you do it. Now, the rest of the features are not quite as complex, uh, but so let's just quickly go through all of this at one time. And uh, if you were doing the lesson from the tape, it would be a good time to break. But since we're going on, we'll now look at the lips. Now, again, I remember there were only four or five things I mentioned to, to you on the eye to remember. When we come to the lips, we're going to have the same situation. Okay, there's really only a few things to remember. One is that we want to make sure that uh, we remember that the top lid is going to be smaller than the bottom lid. And then as you do the lips, remember you have a lost and found contour, meaning that uh, you don't have just it's nothing on the face should ever look like it's just cut out and pasted on there. So with that in mind, let's proceed to sketch the lips. Now, Begin with a center line. You see, everything, if, you, if you're doing a front view, it's going to always be symmetrical. And we'll come across here like this. Okay, now, because of the curvature and the way the lips are formed, 
I'm going to come up with this line because your top lip is not actually smaller. It just gives you the illusion because of the curves. And it, in, in essence, I guess it really is. All right. For instance, what I'm talking about is that this gives us our definition. Should I go on? Okay, that gives us one side that's going to be symmetrical over here. And it's because of this extra space that we get more of an illusion that the upper lip is uh, actually thinner. And in reality, it is. Okay, now, again, I divided it into third, uh, into halves, and then I created that extra little area at the top. Now, and you notice, Trudy, that the one thing that you can find out doing people, and I found out this particularly, I'm doing my anatomy course with another student now that's quite serious about it, and I, div I div devised my entire anatomy course using mannequins, <coughs> excuse me, a, a few basic facts of anatomy, such as the head measurements and things like this. But in, a, in, the, in the course that I have on anatomy, the primary thing I did was to teach everyone how to visualize the human body as a drafter would look at a cylinder. And you begin with a center line going down the middle. That's how you measure. That's how you get your foreshortening. And then you add the muscles to it. So in a simplified way, everything can be broken down uh, this way. And that's the secret to it. Now we'll have a little area right up under here. Come bring this across like this over here. Okay, now, the shading and the effect of the shading is very important. Uh, I'm trying to make this to look like it's, uh, it's, it's actually uh, a pretty defined indented shape. And I'm going to put it with the shadow. Then I'll come over here and just go in the opposite direction. and then maybe even lose a little bit of it. Now, several things. Number one, the top lid is narrower, but it's also almost 100% of the time darker, okay? Uh, because of the fact that if you were to look at the eye from the side, I mean, the lips from the side, it, it's going to come like this. You see? And because of the indenture, that's what's going to create that, you see? Uh, so, and then of course a lot of it will also be uh, accomplished just by your general shading itself. Now normally what I'll do is I'll put an overall tone to create my middle tones and my lights, such as what I'm doing here. And of course if you're sketching, a lot of times you can, like I'm doing with my pencil, you can actually create the illusion of it, of the form and whatever, just by the stroke of the pencil. But I'll do that, and then in here, Put a little shadow area. Okay, and then in the middle area, I'll do the same thing again. Uh, Matt, you've got a good source to look at. You know, understand I'm doing this very quickly. And then we'll come up here like this. Okay, now, one thing you want to remember is that lost and found contour. You see, you'll generally, like you might have one side, you'll have a strong line. Places in here you can even lose it. Come back again, pick it up. And normally, particularly on the outside lip on the bottom, there'll be places where you really do completely lose it. And of course, the top lid, you make as light or dark as you need to, you see. And I just generally do it according to whatever I feel like I need to do. Okay, now, Here's another important thing to remember. A lot of the anatomy and the likeness of a person will be created by shapes and shadows. And you generally always have a pretty strong shadow right under here. And then, depending on the light source, your shadow here becomes very important also in completing the actual likeness of a person. And it has a lot to do with the definition. So again, lost and found contour, top lip thinner and generally darker. Remember that strong shadow up underneath the lip itself. Okay, let's go to the next uh, portion of this, which is, I think, a little bit simpler even, and it's going to be the nose. Now, what we want to remember as we look at the nose is that it is a four-sided plane. 
okay? And as we begin to sketch it, that's generally the way I'll approach it. Now, if you want it to really be correct, you could start with a center line like this. And of course, everyone's basic proportions are going to be different. So we'll come across like this. Now that's how we have achieved the shape pretty much like what you see here. Okay, it's a four-sided plane. Now with this in mind, this gives us the portion where this will be the bottom of the nose. And it gives us, in other words, everything that you do, it has a structure that you can follow. So we'll start with this. this. I had the plane a little wide here. I'll make my adjustments on that. Now normally the nose is a little thicker in the middle and comes back thinner. You know different people will have this differently but it's not a straight line. Uh, now again shading is very important. You always have, have a shadow here. Whether you see it or not you want to show it. In this particular case, our light source will be on the left. So I'll bring this shadow down. And before I come all the way down with it, let's complete our nostril here and over here. And you'll generally have a little muscle that's going to be defined here. Now, normally under the nose, if the light is coming from the left, all of this is going to be in shadow. And again, you want to have a lost and found effect on that bridge of the nose, you see. Maybe have a little shadow over here. Now I'll come back in. Always going to have a little stronger shadow here. Now, we'll pick up. Notice I covered all of it basically with a middle tone. And we'll put the darks under here. Now, shadows are very important. I'm going to put a cast shadow under here. But you remember that shadow area I was telling you about under the lip? You're going to have, always have the same thing right here. And as hard as it is to imagine it, Trudy, this is what most people just over and over and over again just forget. You see, and I always make it a point to go back to these basics. I do it on anything I do, but on portraiture particularly. Okay, now again, it's probably drawn a little bit better on my sketch, but that gives you a general idea of, of the nose, okay? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, we'll do uh, the ear, which uh, is that part of the anatomy, if and when it's at all possible, cover it up. But since we have to draw it, notice I have on my note, we simplify it with a C and an S. Okay, now actually, it's a C drawn backwards. And you want to get you some, you know, you can always get some kind of perspective in it. And our basic outline here. You see, this tells me that I want this to go all the way. You know, a lot of times you just lose your way. And that tells me I want that to go all the way over here. And of course, it's, again, it's just a general outline. And you, you're, you're subject to change it as you go along with it to do whatever you think it needs to do. It's not a very generally part of the anatomy that's helpful for getting somebody's likeness. Okay, now, again, I like to put in the dark first because that would be like the hair line and uh, it begins to bring out the form. And then again, in here, we'll put our strongest areas first. And then, of course, this will come around here. You'll begin to lose it. And you'll notice that you can almost graphically put this in and then come back in and put your middle tones wherever necessary to, sharp, to soften it. 
Okay, and in general we want to have a little shadow coming down the side of it here. Bring our line down like that. In other words, there's no good ears. That's what we want to remember. Other than to hear with. And of course, the main thing on a lot of this is you just want to do it suggested. Now, while we're concluding this, I might mention that a lot of my students question about when they can do the portraits and they would like to do them, what do you do, and so forth. Well, I'd like for you to complete your first year. Where, that way you have all your technical information down. And then after that, basically whenever a person feels like they're ready, I don't encourage it because I feel that the... Uh, the portraits, are, they're not like trees and buildings and things that you can just fake in there and it doesn't make any difference. Uh, you have to really be disciplined and you have to be ready. And many times people will get into it because, and they're not ready, and uh, it'll become a disaster to you because it's probably the most difficult thing you'll ever attempt to do. But as I said earlier, when Trudy asked me about doing it, anybody can do an elephant and a bunch of lines can do a portrait course without any trouble. Now, likewise, <clears throat> I'll put a little bit of shading under here just for the heck of it. I might have this a little bit thick compared to the one I've well, actually I forgot this shadow. Of course, this will be different on everyone, you know, the basic. <clears throat> but again, you're going to generally have a shadow under the ear. You know, that dark black place I was telling you about is always going to be right under that lobe. And you study pictures and you'll start seeing this. And of course, the shape of it and how it formed and whatever has a lot to do with likeness believe it or not okay uh, that pretty well concludes it on the ears and again the primary thing is to remember the C and the S you're not gonna hardly ever see a view of the ear like this naturally because we don't do people from the side normally but uh, but you imagine it in various stages of foreshortening and one little tidbit before I close is that you know if you foreshorten it like this and you remember it, it goes like this. What's nice about this, you're going to see part of this, but you can still follow the same basic structure concepts, and you can still use the S and whatever. It's just in a much more modified way, just pushing it together like that, you see. And, of course, here you'd see probably the, top, the entire top of the ear and whatever hairline, and so forth. But that's what this is to basically help you to visualize. Okay, now this complete, completes the second lesson on this. And then what, I'd, uh, what we'll do next week is we've, we've looked at how to place the features on the face. Uh, today we've looked at um, how to uh, actually observe facts about features because portraiture like doing trees. I think the discipline in terms of studying facts and observing facts is more critical than anything. That's why I think everybody ought to take portraits. And everyone should do it eventually because it's such a good discipline if you like to draw and you want to master the drawing. You just can't fake it. But now, after studying the placement of the features, facts about the features this week, our next lesson, we're going to take a simplified portrait of that old man in, in the set that you've got where we're going to actually draw and put all of this together and complete a person without a lot of detail in the anatomy. And I think you'll find it's a lot of fun. But for today, we'll go ahead and do this. Pencil technique, and I'm going to get a sketchbook. In fact, I've got a piece of scrap board in here. And if you remember the basic uh, the basic thing we're trying to do on here is to teach the pencil sketching method that's very much like a uh, what you would do in a watercolor and that we're going to the main objective that we have, let's see if you got the two A's, I think you have. Okay. Is 
I'm going to try to do this in a way that it looks like a, uh, a, a flat wash. And uh, so if you remember, we're going to start in this progression. We're going to begin with the 2H, HB, 2B, 4B, or higher. Now, it was my experience, if I began with something like a 2B, no matter what I did, and trying to shade it. It always left a little texture in the board. Okay? That's the problem I had for years, is how to get rid of that. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a process whereby we're going to start with the 2H and we're going to layer it in uh, layers. very lightly, almost no pressure at all. Mm -hmm. We'll come out to a certain point, and we notice by doing that and then blending it, it's almost a perfectly smooth gradation. In other words, it's actually, it's pencil and pe texture flowing beautifully to where it's just absorbing the texture just like you want it. Now the rule is you want to progress from the 2H to the HB and never skip. So as we darken, even with this HB, if you want with it first. It would leave some residue. You see the nice smooth gradation? You can even see it up there very nicely. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now you notice again, I'm getting it darker, mm -hmm. but I'm perfectly, I'm working perfectly consistently with my, uh, put this up here, 2H. Oh, excuse me, that was, okay, HB, now let's go to 2B. We went from 2H, HB. Again, notice I'm using my, I'm just leaving, it's all wrist action here. That's 2B. 2B. Again, see how nicely and evenly the texture stays with it. And lastly, the 4B. And in no case, now I might bear down a little bit harder here. Fill in a little bit more. Now, let's say in the event I wanted to come back, you notice that Compared to this now, we have a complete smooth gradation. Now, let's say there's some uneven spots in there that I don't care for. So we'll go back, we can either go back to the 2H now, or the HB. This is no pressure. Just do it until we just about get all of that out of there completely. Get the general idea? Okay, now, we had, we've had a lot of theories about that uh, and what causes it and how it happens and all that. And I remember uh, Joe Lackey was uh, mentioning one night that, that, you know, graphite is a lubricant. And he wondered if maybe that had something to do with it, that you start off with the one that works the, you know, that, that would be the least, uh, would leave the re least amount of residue and then each succeeding layer has a residue to go over, you know, has a lubricating part under it. And we just wondered if it may have something to do with that, but whether it does or not, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> okay, now what, what we're going to do here is we get, just remember, always remember the progression, 2H. Now, just like I told the ones working on the bottle back there and everybody's starting, of course, I always prefer to begin with the, a particular place where I can establish my lights, middle tones, and darks. Now, if you'll notice, Stratton, on the piece that you've got here, 
We'll start off with those, uh, and it was fun to see those sergeant eyes at that museum in real life. And we'll start off with that basic 2H. And I'm going to do this like a wash. First of all, I'll just take that and blend it. back around and do this again. Now, just draw a light line under here. See, again, if I can do it, I still prefer using my finger. You see that nice, soft edge it gives it? Okay, now there's only a little bit of a highlight area right here. Question. Sure. How come you always start with the eyes? Is that just a, a, a natural focus point? Well, Janet, I, I, your timer was off. I told you to ask that about two minutes ago now. Oh, you messed me off. <laughs> no, that's a good question, Janet. What, uh, what, what I like, the reason I like to start with the eyes and then move over to the shadow on the nose and then the nose itself and so forth is the fact that I can get my lightest lights and my darkest darks in these one, in this one area. And it's just like what I'm doing with them on that bottle back there and teaching them, see? Isn't that, isn't that amazing how that goes on so smoothly? In other words, I can stay in this one area until I get everything established and that's what will tell me what to do. And for those of you working on that bottle back there, uh, this is the same principle. I'm having you go back and establish yourself on your bottle, and you're going to use that as a guideline to do the rest of the painting. And uh, as far as your values, likewise, if you look up on the monitor right now, you'll see I'm developing lights and middle tones as I progressively make my darks in this area. I will gain control of it to the point that it'll tell me what to do on the rest of the whole picture, and that's what I'm trying to get you all to do. Okay, well, I'd appreciate it. All right, now, but you did good for the first time. I'm going to do like they do at the movies and all the, the, the talk shows, you know, when I'm recording. I mean, I'm going to have stunt people in there. Just <laughs> keep the... <laughs> so, it's not that Plants. <laughs> Your plants, yeah. <laughs> Especially when I tell my jokes, I'm going to have somebody <laughs> laughing. How about just patting myself on the back? Because yeah. I thought, well, I wonder where is he going to start? And I thought, well, he has to start with the eyes. I just said that to myself How about that? before you did say anything. You notice I'm just putting like a light watercolor wash all over everything, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I've got that built into a point where I'll come back in now with my... Uh, I'll go to my HB. Now see, I know how dark I can get in the eye, and I'm going to have some of my darkest darks around that eye. Mm -hmm. That just goes on so nice and smooth. We're going to remember Sergeant. We come back around here. And whether we exactly see it that way or not. Keep 
Modify, oh yeah, and look at that. Now mm. that brings that out, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, see, I notice that, notice I'm not working just one area at a time. I'm doing this, then I'm doing up on, I'm grouping the darks, in other words, Stratton, okay? Up here, I could move into this area, he's got a nice little shadow in here. And actually, he covered the whole top of the eye. Yeah, with the white on the highlight on the eye. Came back with the white paint. That's right. So you don't worry about leaving that. Leaving mm -hmm. that little space in there. Right. The white okay, you can really begin to see it develop now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as I'm continuing to do that, I'll pick up some of these other areas. Surely you can really begin to see it come on. Yeah, he just don't age big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just yeah. don't feel like he has that much contrast in this particular. I know that in that picture, see, not like I've got them on. I know. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So I had to improvise a lot when I did that. Every now and then, that might have just been a little long that you had in there, but that'll cover later, so I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah, they definitely have the same yeah. precision. Okay, now. This is where this works out very nicely. Gosh. They have that little bit of clean stuff and the one that's more suitable to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to go one step further the 2B and I'm going to begin to commit myself a little bit more in these darks. And then again, I'm going to give him the little milky look. See, the main thing, you notice I'm not really applying any pressure. It's building layers. That's it. Then at some point when I think it's ready, come in and do that and then so I don't overwork it I'll either go to back to my 2H or HB one thing I, I might stress to you is to really keep a uh, keep a good point on your pencil and I'll tell you the thing that's so striking about this is well the students that have going through this course or let's say going through it maybe and just never really applied it because I didn't like pencil as an example okay that would eventually go back and, and come back to this I'll tell you this this particular technique has been the turning point of more people in this curriculum remember the little guideline about I already used the HB Mm -hmm. I'm in the 2A, so I'm right. using the HB. Remember the little guideline about leaving the edges lighter, uneven rather, so it doesn't look like it's stuck on his face. You see, as I progressively build my docks up, I'll get more courageous with the docks. All right, now I'll go to the 2B. I'll kind of darken a little bit more on the inside of it. OK, 
Okay, now likewise, I know that looks a little bit harsh, but now I'm going to come in with my two bit. <coughs> Start enhancing. They see how I'm just doing this almost mm -hmm. freely now. And you see like right here where it's a little bit too defined. I'll lose that eyebrow like this, you see. Just keep enhancing it, enhancing it. I'm gonna make this a little bit rougher here. I'll look at places like this and as it builds up it looks real dark and it's really nice. I'm trying to avoid lines, but also I want clear cut definition. So you look at it different ways and you just gotta keep playing with it. I'm trying to always do it with this, you know the least amount of effort as far as the pencil you use. Mm -hmm. until you go down to the last stage, how much difference uh, all the last minute things. And of course, a lot of this will be quite a bit darker and enhanced by it. But I'm gonna go get a little bit of that white paint now. Seems so easy to get it. There's some white paint? Uh, <laughs> when I try to do it, ain't it? Right here. Go ahead. You got yeah. something there right now? Just a little bit. We're gonna make you we're gonna make him the official French quarter painter. Oh, no, just because he won't have to put trees down there, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, Jim. <laughs> okay, now Stratton, watch this. Watch this last little bit of thing. Boy, it's really amazing. With that nice yep. part. Look at that. Look at it on the TV mind. Oh. Um, speaks life to the eye. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hey, why don't you play with this? You go ahead. No, I never did. See, that doesn't mean you have to. Mm -hmm. See, on, on this one, I never did. Now, if I can find something, uh, I'm going to show you something I recommend. Right. Uh, find what I do and how long have you been studying? Yeah, I'm trying. Have you been taking? <sighs> okay, now if you get you one of these uh, yeah. five millimeter pencils with the HB, look at this. You probably do because there's. Al, I always show you the thing what you do with that five millimeter pencil at the end. And you just fill it in. Just, huh? I might not have. Uh, but see, the, sometimes I don't have one around, <laughs> and I forget. But see, at, at that last stage, after you put all your basic stuff in, mm -hmm. if you just come in with that, like if my contacts are driving me crazy, if you just come in with this five millimeter and just run, look, I'm not even bare now, Stratton. You can just absolutely work that thing into as something that looks like silk. Mm -hmm. That that little five millimeter HB mm -hmm. lead in it. This is, and you just do that lightly over yes, all the different Yes, Yes, every, everything. That's right. Depending on how smooth you want it to be. Mm -hmm. You see? Mm -hmm. We done good, Strat. Yeah, right. I'm going to let you good. take this one home. I don't think anybody else is using it. If you want to work okay. on it at home. Because yeah, once you... Like see, what, this will be a guideline. Yeah, because but once you get your two just... eyes in and all that, then you really will have to use what you do to finalize the rest of it, okay? Okay. 
So why don't you work on that for a few minutes in the time we got left, and uh, All right. I'm gonna give you, and I'll write you up a ticket. Now, that's my needed eraser here, unless you I need it. You're welcome tomorrow. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> and then I will finalize things on that frame, and I'm gonna do that with you now. So okay. 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 Just well, Strat, we got you on GPT. All right. All right. Okay, now the, the primary thing, as I mentioned, that I want to to do on this is to uh, is to make sure that uh, that you uh, understand that the primary thing I want to do is to show you, like in the black and white picture that we just finished, uh, you found that by by taking your time and, and layering the layers on it, it's almost like watercolor washes, where you don't really it's not so much how dark you make it or how much medium you use, it's how you apply it to get the subtleties. And I found that in any of the mediums, uh, charcoal, uh, black and white, and, uh, charcoal, I should say, uh, graphite pencil, whatever, if, if any of the medium is excessive, it ages the person and takes away from it looking more attractive. And so what we're going to do in Bob Hope, it's not everybody's favorite subject, but uh, but, but it, it was a good sample that I had to work from, from the cover of a magazine. And, uh, and, and if you'll notice, about 90% of this is, is going to be the paper, okay? And there really is a l very little in the way of the charcoal and, and, the, uh, and the pastel pencil. And so uh, the, 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 the lesson in this, in this is the fact that you don't need a lot to accomplish it. You don't need a, a, a lot of medium to accomplish it. Okay, so with that in mind, we'll take, we'll just set this up here where I can observe it. And uh, we'll go to this now. Let's see if I can get my remote control, battery operated remote control thing here. Bring that in. Okay, now what we have, oh, that's gonna be great. Okay, now what we have here is uh, a layout that you did uh, transferred and uh, now notice, uh, notice that, um, the uh, the layout that, that you made, and, and let's talk a little bit of, about layouts here, because many people don't realize there's really an art to to transferring things, and uh, and and the reason for it is that it's it's a it's the most important step before you actually start painting, whether it's in watercolor or whatever, and so I think you have to take great care to make sure you have a good piece of graphite that you don't overly put it in there. And I would personally rather transfer something too lightly and then come back and take the time to touch it up and make sure I have everything correctly. Uh, so in, in the case of what you did here, around the outside part of it where it's not too heavy, I really like that because it gives you the flexibility to come in and actually draw it and observe it a little bit more closely and get it up to a point that uh, you, you really have a better feel from as far as what you're doing uh, as opposed to just transferring it when you're just tracing lines and not really thinking about the thing as a whole. Okay, so we've come back and, and touched up this area now where we're pretty well ready to go. Now, we're going to use something a little bit different this time. Uh, we're going to use a, a white pastel pencil, and uh, that'll be for our highlights. The paper itself will be the middle tone. And then we have a 2B charcoal pencil that we're going to use for our shading. Now what's going to make it significant is, is that this last, uh, or, or what makes the last thing you did significant is we're going to pretty well use the same layering approach in the charcoal, but by using the stump and the texture of the paper, we can grade it with one pencil instead of having to change it. So we're actually going to smoothen and blend it. Now, the people ask me all the time, why do I start with the, with the eye? And I generally will start a portrait with an eye. And if I'm going to be painting like a direct portrait, I'll, I'll generally start with the eye and then I'll surround it like this and say if I'm on a white canvas. 
and then I'll actually move out in all directions from that eye to where it looks like somebody cut a hole through a sheet mm -hmm. and put it over it. Now, there's a reason for that, and I call it control. And what you actually accomplish is um, you will, will not only work out, if you're doing it in color, you'll work out all your colored uh, problems, you'll work out your value problems, and just like anything else that you do, you'll form a miniature completed area that'll tell you what to do on the rest of the entire picture. Uh, if you'll notice on our layout here, I'll put that on the screen for just a second, the, uh, the, the shadow, the strongest darks are going to be in the pupil of the eye, and in this case, the strongest shadows will be over here and in the eyebrows itself, or, or themselves. So what I like is you get your values and you get your technique and you really get everything worked out here to the maximum so that everything else that you do, you can relate back to it. So a lot of people ask me that question and uh, I should have taken, given the stand that you offered me. I, I think that's what I should have put it on. Thank you. A lot of people ask me, why do I do that? And then portraits, I've just found it's not just, you know, a habit. It's just uh, I've found that that's, that's the best area because it gives me all the information that I'm looking for. Okay, now, relating back to the pencil technique, okay, I'm going to get a good point on the pencil. And that's another thing I want to stress as we're talking about this, is that if you remember, I took the white... Uh, Getting back to the materials, I didn't finish that. We have a white uh, pastel pencil. We have a 2B charcoal medium pencil and a, a very small stump that's good for little detail areas and portraits. Now, if you'll notice, if you're familiar with pastel pencils, they don't come with that kind of point. And as you remember, uh, I pointed out to you it's important to get it uh, sharpened very, very precisely where you can control it. And the same way with your charcoal pencil, because anything that's not controlled, you're going to just put it on excessively and then you have to take it back out again. Okay, now you have a certain amount of texture in the, in the paper, so notice how I'll come around like this, and remember we talked about the fact that you got to go back and make sure the pupil and all of that's lined up. That's hard to do when you're transferring. So now, what I've done here is I'm just doing this in a circular motion, and basically filling it in pretty much like we did on that pencil study. Now, think of the eye as one unit, okay? And, and so consequently, if, if you do that, you're not gonna separate like the pupil from, from the white of the eye, and the iris from the white part of the eye. You're gonna recognize that what we're doing is shadows and values. And so in this case, we're gonna put not only the first shadow on here, but we're gonna put the shadow under the eyelid. Okay, now there are certain standard things that, uh, that, that you repeat over and over again in portraits, Trudy, and the thing I've noticed with people, you know, so much of this is just discipline. And I've noticed so many times with people that, that it's not the drawing or the likeness or all the other things that they are missing to keep them from really getting this thing, getting it correctly. It's that they'll forget the basic anatomy that I taught them in the first lesson about the features. Uh, all the way from the fact that we have that little shadow under the eye, m much the, one of the biggest things that people forget, and uh, the fact that the white of the pupil, the white highlight is going to be between the iris and the pupil. You'll never see it in a photograph like that. You see, I, I haven't gotten into that with you, but that's what we're going to do on this one. You, you may see two or three highlights in the middle, all around the iris and the pupil of the eye. Well, you don't want to put all of that in there. You see, that's just something from reflected light. So notice how I'll put this part in first. Now, I'll come under here, and uh, I'm going to just develop a somewhat of a middle tone area. Okay, now, uh, going back to what we're attempting to do, I'm going to lay in, like, just all, think of this like as if you were doing a watercolor. And I'm going to layer in a basic light wash. Okay, and, and I'm just going to put in flat tones. 
Now sometimes from your graphite and whatever you'll you'll have little areas like that where it's not even and I'm gonna show you how to take care of that in a minute. But mainly don't bear down. Uh, you know, just let the learn to let the medium do it do the work for you. Okay, and then we see you come around here and we have all the now right here for instance. You see very, very gently. Not trying to do a lot of shading or anything like that. I'm just going to build it up to a certain point. Really study my values and shapes. We had a pen and ink uh, artist that came here from one of the ink companies, uh, one of the pen companies, a few years ago. Conanor, I think, is the one that sent him. I don't know whether anybody in the class was there. I think you were. Okay. No, I okay. Yeah. And uh, and it, it's funny how you. You learn something from everyone if you listen, and and it's something I would have never thought I would I would have something to find for portraits from a pen and ink artist. But what he he said basically was that if you uh, when you're doing people, what you're actually observing is not just facts and features, but each person will have the the different parts of the facial anatomy broken up broken up into shapes and then as far as the middle tones and the darks and whatever and then you'll actually have shapes within those shapes you see and so this is what essentially I'm doing right here and and so you keep progressively incorporating the shapes and it's the development of this part of it that gives you the lightness not the uh, you know uh, any other particular thing like you would think it would be so this is what we're doing right now, is just basically, now remember on the first lesson on the nose, I always said there was a ridge up here. Now, it's accented a lot more when you Bob Hope's age, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it is a, a thing that's there. You can remember I carefully laid all of this in, so I know exactly where I'm going with it. And then we have a little ridge here. We'll put that in. And then uh, we'll come up to this entire section up at the top. And you notice again, it's almost like a broadside stroke as opposed to specifically shading or whatever. Okay, now, you remember when you did charcoal, the best way to blend charcoal, once you get it in there, it is either, if you're going to be putting it in on charcoal paper, normally I just actually put it in with a circular motion, and then I shade it with a circular motion, and that way it really blends it into all of the pores. Now, of course, I'm going to reach a point in a minute where I'm, I can't do that much longer, and so I switch to this little stump where I can control it better. Now remember I John seeing a sergeant eyes. Uh, do we ever talk about that? Well, on the other one, I don't know no. what I did with no. it. Well at the end of this I'm gonna get my book out. And, my John Singer Sergeant book and I'll record this for you because uh, what's that? Well John Singer Sergeant had a way of doing eyes where he you know he, he did a lot of females a lot of the nobility in Europe and whatever and as far as I'm concerned he, he glamorized ladies better than any artist I've ever known in history and one of his techniques was to was to actually run the uh, the, the pupil blended into the iris uh, and, and have it become what I call a kind of a milky look and uh, it's, it's very very attractive and, and it makes the eyes very soft and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It's just a technique he had that I thought worked very nicely. 
and I just instinctively I'm going to make some of that a little darker because it's in the shadow. Okay, now, with that in mind, pretty much got my strong middle tone in the charcoal, my middle tone paper, and I'm going to come in now and put the dark in starting with the pupil. And I always like to start with the pupil because uh, the pupil is going to be naturally the darkest place on the face because it's going to be black. So once you put that pupil in, you don't have to worry about making anything else uh, dark because you can go that dark and it'll work. Now, as I mentioned on the, uh, on the little bar, and if I didn't, I will now, uh, that uh, people have I found this out from some of my students that did this. People have different, uh, notice how this is not filling in completely because of the graphite. Okay, so that's why I think it's better to do it lighter and transfer it. Um, but, but like some people's eyes will bleed right out with no definition. Some people on the edges. Some people have a line around the exterior. Some people have no pigmentation whatsoever. It's just smooth. And of course, all of these things are part of the kind of things you observe to do people's portraits. Okay, now we'll just continue this up like this. Bring that all the way down. Now, in keeping with our John Singer Sergeant technique and our, uh, our fact that we're trying to make all of this appear as one, uh, I'll come back in now and I'll take my pencil in and whatever areas are too defined, so like right there, I'll have to go back in with my uh, with my stump now because of the graphite. Now sometimes I don't know why it does it more than others, but you know, there's a way around it. Okay, now there's a now he's kind of up in years, so some of these lines, if you define them a little bit, it's not going to be offensive. But on others where, even if they're there, you can put them in without really broadcasting it to the world. Okay. Again, I don't have to worry about getting that too dark because it really is relatively dark. Uh, Okay, now I have just a thin line here, and one here. We don't have too much of a line under here, but we'll put enough to just suggest it. And of course, this other side over here. Now, notice this ridge will come back up underneath here. Now, there's a shadow under here. I want to continue the shadow of that eye. See, as I develop each successive stage, I'll progressively get darker, but I'll control it. And they see, like up in here, I want all of this to be like, it's one shadow across the top of it. You see? Okay, now, I'm going to do this. Now, as we come out here, this particular part is going to be pretty dark. show you the difference. Now after getting a little bit better point on the uh, on the pencil now, I can see where some of these areas, in which what you want to prevent is the excess of buildup of the graphite. Now watch the difference. Now look at how I'm absolutely filling the pores. See, and that's why when you get to this kind of thing, I take the time that I need to take to show you this correctly, because there's something that it took me 15 to 20 years of experimenting before I discovered these things, and I just worked at it, each one of them individually. And I think the fact that I do this and that my students 
want to do it and take the time to learn it is why people get such good results with it. But you can see the difference now in what I'm talking about here. Okay, now, let me get this a little darker in here. It almost becomes a pencil and a stump at the same time. So like right, okay, that's going to be okay except here. I want to make a little bit more shading under that part of it there. I don't want any of this to really stand out. Now notice I'll come up here and I've got a fairly dark area here. I'll develop this a little bit further. As you build it up, you'll progressively have to get a little bit darker with some of this. And, and the more uh, charcoal you get on there, of course, the, the easier it is to get darker. You know, you, you just build it up and build it up. And now again, and of course, what I love about this uh, is that you, you really just eventually put your own particular style into it. And, approach to it and everybody's is different and I noticed it and it makes it very interesting and really exciting and teaching it okay now after I put this middle tone in here I notice right at the base of this area there's a little bit more I wonder what a wash of coffee looks like <laughs> Just, you stuck your brush in your coffee no I I've done that two or three times. Oh, no. uh, okay, now. <laughs> now I'll put my little extra dark here. Uh, not my day today. <clears throat> okay, now. Let me see in here. I'll just put a slight. So he doesn't have a lot of shading. You can use my umbrella. <laughs> Okay, remember on the eyes, the, the, the technique I taught you where you, you can have it really dark on the inside, but you don't want to have it very definite around the exterior part of it. So a lot of this we can just kind of blend together. Before I forget to, I always like to come in and emphasize that little part of the nose because that's very important as far as I'm concerned for the form of it. And I know this seems like it's kind of time consuming and painstaking to do it, but I mean that's how you master this stuff and uh, that's how you get people to look natural and, and, uh, and I'll soften some of the edges now. Back here I'm just loosen it up a little bit. I've been over there. May I have a question? Okay. When you're doing Wait. the whole body. Mm -hmm. And I always start with the face because if I don't get the face right, I don't want to do it, do you know? I think that's a good approach. Well, then I get the body. And if, there, if that's okay, then I'm ready for the background. And then I run into trouble because doing that background, you've got to blow that stuff off. You talk about the pastel? Yeah. yeah. And then suddenly, it'll, if you're not careful, it'll drift over what you've done. And I've had that happen before, and then you've got to work on it. Well, what you've got to do when you get to that point the next time, you've just got to wait and let me uh, show you what to do on that. Okay. There's a way you can control it. Okay. Now, I don't have my needed array. Okay, because that's a... I don't need it, but I'm just going to tell you, like I said, right here, if you get it a little bit too dark, you can do it one of two ways. You can either do it or do it with the uh, white pencil. And you notice again, I'm just taking each section and I'm just developing it a little bit more. Taking one area, sticking with that one area, and uh, again, I like to use my fingers like that. And of course, is it civil? Yeah, I'll put that heat up just a second and get that out. Okay. You just you get what you find out just a little bit will do you on, on this. And I say I was telling you about the singer John Singer Sergeant Eyes and we're coming here and, and you just kind of blend both of them together. Okay.
Okay, now that's the, that's the little dot that you want to put between the iris and the pupil. I tell you what, Trudy, we're good. <laughs> then you're transferring it. Now, remember that little technique about putting the white and the and between the pupil and the iris, okay? Now, again, it's the same thing with this. We don't want to use excessive white. Now, notice up here, I'm going to just kind of do it in a circular motion and blend it and build it up. Then in the middle, I'm going to hit it with my highlight. You see? And then like in here, I wanted to build it up there and blend it out. Now this paper, sometimes I can get this green, sometimes I get the other, and it doesn't give you quite the contrast uh, because it's a little lighter, but it's also a little softer, all, you know, so, so each thing you do has its own particular advantage. You see, like here, I can come back in and fill this back in with this. You see how that's supposed to really come alive? Okay, and then we come down here. And then, of course, mm -hmm. I might have gone up a little too high with my charcoal, but that, that doesn't matter. You know, you just, you just need to get enough in here to highlight it. And then if you want to come back and overlap it. Remember old Bob Hope, Larmé? Yeah. You did old Bob. Uh -huh. Is that it started raining out there? Yeah, it just started. The first time I came in, it wasn't raining. Now. Okay, and I think this pretty well gives you the idea of what we're talking about in the technique. And uh, now, notice that on the on the shadow, any questions about any of it, Trudy? Notice that on the shadow part of it, I'll have to do one more thing. Most of your shading is going to be right in here. See, most of your shading is going to be on the right side of the face. Over here, you really have very little tone. And that's what you don't want to overwork. Okay, and the biggest thing, that's, I think it looks a little, I think it's a little pretty on this gray myself. Okay, and, uh, and notice again, and, and on the highlights, you build the highlights up and then put the dot. A lot of people just put the strong dot right against the gray and it looks a little bit artificial. Well, okay, but, so, working out from this point, then what... Okay, what I do, I'd come around, I'd go around and do the other eye and it. the nose. You know, you could come down the side of the face, it doesn't matter. Uh, but, you know, again, your next darkest areas will be in the nostrils and so forth, so... But you got a good guideline to refer back to. Okay, now, if you can wait just one second. Okay, I want to get that book I was telling you about. Okay, this is just the cover of a, uh, a John Singer Sargent book, and I just wanted to show it to you because I just, I think that he's, and, and the unique thing about it, if you've ever seen his work, is some of it in the New Orleans Museum, is if you, if you would, like if there were pearls on here, or you look at the details on the book, you stand back across the room, and everything looks like it's so perfect, and when you get up on it, there's no detail. You know, he did them all directly, and it's just an ingenious way that he uh, he studied all throughout Europe, and he is really one of my favorite all-time artists, uh, particularly with portraits. Now, what I wanted to point out about the, what I'll call the, uh, the John Singer Sargent eyes that are, I'll bring this in as close as I can get it, see if I can, okay. Let me close it up. Okay, now notice what I was pointing out to you here. Okay, and that's the fact that you notice the top, it's like it's all connected together, the values are. 
and then you come with a little detail at the top of the exterior part of the uh, of the of the iris, and then he fades it into nothing. The pupil starts solid black, but it fades into it, and it'll even pick up a little reflected light in the bottom of the eye. And then, of course, you notice where the white dot is between the iris and the pupil. But you notice the kind of subtle softness and suggestion that he has in there. And that's what I'm referring to when I refer to, uh, to, to John Singer Sargent's eyes that he put on people because, to me, it, it just looks very, very, very beautiful and, and sensual, really, I think, in the way that he accomplished it. And, and yet, if you look at it in, in a close-up like this, as well as the eyebrows, all of that blends together. You know, there's really not a lot of detail on it. So uh, that's what I was referring to, and that'll just give you a little further exposure to that. Okay.